Um, so today we'll be talking about advanced considerations for RAG, which uh, are basically the chunking, uh, the embeddings, the chunking methods, the embedding models, and the metadata that you use. Um, so my name is Eugene Tang. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate at Zillis. You can scan that QR code there for my LinkedIn, and you can follow me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, as introduced, I've been in software since about 2013, and I've been in AI ML since about uh, 2016. Um, and uh, today we'll be talking about RAG stuff because all I've been doing over the last year is building RAG and AI agents. So I'll tell you a little bit about Zillis. Zillis is a vector database company. We maintain Milvis, which is the world's most popular vector database. And it is the only distributed vector database. And we also maintain GBT Cache and VDB Benchmark. Uh, VDB Benchmark is an open source benchmarking tool that you can use to you know, benchmark your vector databases uh, in terms of Queries per second, queries per dollar, throughput, many, many things. Um, all of the data is open. And I recommend that you use this as your benchmarking tool. You can bring your own data very easily. And then we also have GPT Cache, which is a very popular project meant for uh, semantic cache in production. Um, and now let's cover what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going to be talking about why you should be doing RAG, like, you know, what is the difference between RAG and other ways to customize your LLMs, um, how you should think about chunking your data, and how you should think about your embeddings models and other strategies involved with that. And then at the end, we'll cover vector databases, and I will tell you a little bit about how Milvis works. Okay, so let's begin with RAG. The basic premise behind RAG is that you have some data that is your own private data, and you want to use that data with some sort of LLM. And the idea behind how RAG works is kind of can be captured in this little picture right here. So this little diagram shows that what you basically do is you take your data and you're going to put it into a vector database like Novus. Now, I'm, I'm actually missing a little block here that would be the embeddings model. Um, but some people already have their embeddings and you don't need to run data through an embeddings model if you already have your embeddings. Um, but basically you take your data, you embed it, and you put it into a vector database. And then uh, when you want to use this application, when you want to use your data, what you do is you build a large language, you put a large language model on top of the vector database. And now you have their basic structure for a RAG application. And at query time, what you do is you ask a question to the RAG um, application. <clears throat> and the LLM will take your question and it will construct it in a way that makes sense. Uh, well, depending on how you make it, but let's say that you make it ideally, it would take your question and construct it in a way to make sense to find a semantically similar answer. And then it takes that construction, it embeds that, and it searches the vector database for the most semantically similar um, data. And it can be top K, like the top 10 results, or it could be something based on the magnitude of the distance. And then what happens is it takes that data from the vector database, it puts it into the LLM, and the LLM then says, okay, so now I have this context for, the, um, for this question, and this is how I'm gonna answer this question. So it takes the context, and it takes your question, and then it spits back a human readable response for you to be able to understand. So the basic premise behind this is that you want to use this vector database to inject your data and force the model to only answer questions based on the data that you have. And so the best use case here is basically factual recall and cost optimization. Now I call these slides RAG versus fine tuning, but really, <clears throat> fine tuning is something that you can put on top of RAG or do in parallel with RAG. These are not things that are, um, let's say, uh, uh, completely separate from each other, but uh, rather things that you can actually combine 
Um, it just so happens that I got this question of, of like, you know, RAG versus fine tuning a lot. And the real answer here is that these things have different use cases. So in RAG, what you would do is you take your data, you put it into the Vetro database, and then you use that as the context to answer questions. With fine tuning, what you do is you take your data and then you use that to fine tune your large language model. And now your large language model essentially has something like, um, you can think of fine tuning almost as adding like a little bit of context uh, as part of the prompt. So if you were to give it like a prompt about, uh, you know, some answering some question, now it has this context ahead of it in a sense. And the reason why that why that is, is because if you just think about the magnitude of data that is used in training an LLM versus fine tuning an LLM and the way the fine tuning works, you can kind of see that there's no way that you can really force the LLM to only use the data that you use to fine tune it. And also in most cases, you do not have as much data as the entire internet. And so you can influence some of the statistics of how the LLM will predict its next token, but it's impossible to basically force it to use that context, okay? And so in practice, what happens is you fine tune your LLM, and then when you ask it a question, it knows to answer that question in a certain manner. And so the primary use case for this is typically some sort of style transfer. It could be also like a way of picking up jargon, right? So if you think about it, like you want your LLM to talk like a software engineer or to, to write code. In that case, the fine tuning makes a lot of sense because now like you say like, oh, like SDLC, you know, outside of software, like what does that really mean? Nobody really knows. So that's the difference between fine tuning and RAG. RAG is basically used to inject your data. Fine tuning is used to allow the LLM to have an understanding of how you want it to interact. Okay, so the takeaway here, like I just said, RAG to use RAG to force the LLM to work with your data by injecting it via some sort of vector database such as Milvis or Zillis. Okay, so let's talk about some of these considerations that are important in RAG. If you're gonna be building a RAG app, you can't just throw your data in and call it a day. That's not gonna work. So you're gonna to have to learn how to do some important pieces of the RAG tuning process. And the first thing we're gonna cover is chunking. So chunking is the way that you separate out your text so that you can actually understand or so that the LLM has, let's say, understandable pieces of text. And your chunks should be semantically coherent. Each chunk should mean something on its own in a way that you can understand. So, oh, I have some questions. Let's see if there's any questions I can answer before this piece. Can you talk about RAG versus GPT with a knowledge base? Um, I don't really understand what this means. I think you're like GPT with a knowledge base is basically RAG from what I understand. So uh, if you want to give a more, uh, you know, fine tuned response uh, or question, I can try to respond to that. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, what does RAG stand for? Yep, retrieval, augmented generation. Okay, cool. Is chunking the same as categories? No, we'll talk about this in a bit. Okay, so there are three considerations that I tell people that they should think about when it comes to chunk size and these consider, or when it comes to chunking. And so these considerations are chunk size, which is just like, you know, how long is like how many characters, how many uh, tokens is your chunk? Um, chunk overlap, which is, you know, how much does one chunk of text overlap with the other? And then character splitters, which are a specific character that you see that you can split your chunks on. Okay. So these are three considerations of chunking. And now let's look into how each of these might impact your data. So I've given you three examples of what your data may look like on this screen. Now, these aren't the only examples of what your data may look like, but these are three types of data that you will commonly come across if you are building a basic RAG application, like a RAG application across some sort of data set, right? So conversation data is very, very common in, let's say, if you are doing customer service or if you're working with some sort of customer service tool, 
conversation data is very, very uh, common. And conversation data looks something like this. You know, here's one line, here's another line, here's one line, here's another line. Sometimes you have longer lines and longer text, but it's pretty much gonna be line by line by line, right? It's call and response, basically. And so with conversation data, you probably don't need to think about the uh, character, the chunking overlap that much. Uh, each piece of conversation is typically a semantically coherent uh, thing, but you might want to attach like questions and answers, but we'll cover that in metadata. Um, but typically when it comes to chunking, you don't really need to think too much about how much each sentence is going to overlap with the other. What you do care about here is you care about probably some sort of character splitters that are very important. So maybe you have specific characters that show that, hey, this conversation is, or this piece of text, this piece of conversation is ending, or this piece of conversation is starting. So that's something that you could use. And then the other thing you would think about here is um, your chunk size probably doesn't need to be that big. Like a default chunk size of 512 is probably big enough. And you can, you can even go smaller. And we'll kind of explore some different chunk sizes uh, later on in this talk. So that's conversation data. What about document data? So documentation or document data in general is typically gonna be a bunch of paragraphs, right? Just think about like, the last time you read a book or the last time you read some sort of manual or some sort of paper, it's just a bunch of paragraphs. And so with these paragraphs, these are gonna be paragraphs of probably a longer length, but somewhat varying length. And what you're gonna need here is you're gonna need a decent chunk size that can capture, let's say a paragraph of text or so, or you know, uh, at least half a paragraph, a piece of a paragraph, enough that you can kind of make sense of it. And you'll probably also need to think about the overlap, the amount of overlap between one chunk and the next. And this is so that you can have uh, contextual con continuity throughout your chunks of data. And so documentation data, the two things that you're really gonna think about the most here are probably the uh, chunk size, the actual chunk size, and then the chunk overlap, like how much, uh, how much overlap should I have in between my different chunks. Um, and then you may care about character splitters a little bit. For example, like double new lines are very common to separate paragraphs. And you might want to say like, hey, you know, I don't actually need to have the end of this paragraph and the beginning of this paragraph together. You may also want it together. Once again, it depends on what your data looks like and what you need to do with it. Um, and maybe I'm going to split it right there. So that's the one thing you can do with that. And then this last one is this kind of like lecture or perhaps Q and A kind of data. And this kind of data typically looks like this format, right? So there's um, some like shorter questions, some shorter blocks of text. These are usually questions and then some longer blocks of text. And these are usually answers. Now, sometimes you have long blocks of text that are questions and sometimes you have short blocks of text that are answers, but typically this is what this would look like. And what you wanna do here is you want to look at um, uh, 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 character splitters for sure, because you don't really want to, you know, have half of a question and half of an answer together. Like that doesn't really make any sense. That has no uh, semantic, you know, cohesity to it. Um, so what you want is you'll want to think about, you know, like, oh, should I group my questions and answers together? Or should I just use character splitters and kind of, you know, say like, hey, if it starts with a Q, you know, we're going to do this kind of chunk length. And then if it starts with an A, we're going to do this kind of chunk length. And maybe we'll have to have a variable chunk size so that we can capture the entire answer or the, uh, you know, the entire question or things like that. So these are how you would think about these kinds of data and how they look and how you would chunk this, right? So conversation data, typically you're going to look at smaller chunk size. You don't care about chunk overlap. Document data, you're probably going to look at bigger chunk sizes and you care about chunk overlap. Lecture or Q&A data, you're probably going to care most about how you're going to be splitting up your data. So the character splitters and the way that you design that is going to be probably the most important piece of that. So let's look through some examples. So I took, so I know this is a lot of text, so, you know, don't bother, don't bother reading it too much. Um, I took these, this, this uh, document on how you rise through the different levels of software engineering. And then... I used Langchain and Milvis to create some sort of chunking tool and chunking testing tool. As you can see, I've got these numbers 32, 4, 64, 8, 128, 16, so on and so on. 
And these are representations of the chunking size and the chunking overlap. And I use character splitters on all of these. And you'll see that as we go through, you'll see that, hey, you know, after, uh, you know, like a, a period in a new line, there's, uh, there's an end, right? Not all of these are the same uh, length. So this is something that, you know, um, you should consider. And what we're going to walk through here is just some of the examples of how this works. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so um, I asked the question, what makes a distinguished engineer to this document of engineering levels, basically? And the response from this with 32 character chunks and four character overlaps is basically trash. There's nothing that you can really get out of this, right? Like, is a distinguished engineer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very useful for wondering what makes a distinguished engineer. Engineer, that's even more useful, right? So this is a totally trash chunking strategy. We should scrap this and move on. Okay, so now it's 64.8 with a chunk size of 64 characters and a chunk overlap of eight characters. What we're starting to see is, hey, you know, we're actually getting a real sentence out of this, right? So the first one is still kind of trash. Like engineer is completely useless to me. Um, but, you know, in the as we scroll down, we see that, you know, we get this sentence here that says, Warner Vogel's CTO of Amazon is a distinguished engineer. So at least we have an example of a distinguished engineer. And this is actually under the distinguished engineer block. Okay, so let's move on to this next chunking strategy. So last time we said 64 characters, eight overlap. And so, you know, eight character overlap is really, really small if you think about it. That's like the word engineer, right? So what about the next one up? 128 characters and a 16 character overlap. That's like two or three words. So now when we have this, we can see that there are more full on sentences. Has achieved noteworthy technical professional accomplishments while working as an engineer. That is a requirement to be a distinguished engineer. And then there's like senior software engineer, which is not great. And then provides solid technical leadership beyond the company. And you'll see there's some special characters involved. And so this is also something to think about while you work on your uh, RAG stuff, you can see that I didn't bother to clean up the special characters, but that may be something that is important to you. Um, and then the next part of that is Warner Vogel, CTO of Amazon, distinguished engineer, which we already saw last time. And then everything on the senior staff engineer list plus generally 15 to 20 years of experience. So this is also listed under the Distinguished Engineer uh, umbrella. Okay, so 128.16 is pretty good, actually. We're getting a lot of the responses back that we need. We have an idea of, um, you know, uh, of what it takes to be a, a Distinguished Engineer. So why don't we go on to the next one? So now we're looking at 256 characters, uh, chunk size, with a 32 uh, character overlap. And here, what we see is that we're getting, you know, good amounts of, uh, of text back. Now, this is starting to get pretty big, and we'll see things like this will ordinarily require significant amounts of time over the lifetime of the individual, given this distinction. Provide solid technical leadership, blah, 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 blah. So this first part we know is from the distinguished engineer category, uh, from that section. And um, next, we see like, oh, this is actually also part of uh, this section, right? More in button than the last, less day-to-day -day coding, more thinking, planning, directing, has achieved noteworthy technical professional accomplishments while working as an engineer. And then the next part is everything on the senior staff engineer list, plus 15 to 20 years of experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll see that third and fourth one are actually very similar, but the fourth one is everything on the staff engineer list plus A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that one actually leads to the one before to the senior staff engineer list. So now we're starting to see that we've chunked up enough text that if we pull the first top four back, top four results back, we're not getting, uh, we're, we're getting more information than we need. And this can be, you know, fine. But then what we have to think about with this is, should we only be pulling the top three results back now, right? Now we might have to adjust the strategy for how many results we're going to be pulling back. Okay, so one more up. Let's go to 512 characters with a 64 character overlap. And now what we'll see is pretty much everything comes back in the first two 
um, pieces. And so maybe what we should think about is like a 700 something character strategy. So we get everything in one and maybe like a, you know, some slightly bigger overlap. But what this tells us is that now we've gotten to the point where we can get back all of the information and uh, we have once again, too much information. And maybe what we need is to get back all the information, just the top one result, the top K result, right? So vector databases return like a top K results. And so in this case, maybe we just need, we need two for 512, but maybe if we shift it a little bit larger, we could do it with one. And so you'll see that there's actually multiple viable options here in this set of chunking strategies. And with that kind of, what I want to show you with that is basically that your chunking strategy is not just going to depend on what your data looks like, as I showed you in the beginning, it does depend on what your data looks like, but that's not it. It also depends on what you need from it. So for example, you may want to uh, give the user answers and responses in smaller chunks, one at a time, right? And in that case, the 128 chunking strategy might be perfect for you, but maybe you want to give your user everything at once. And in that case, the 512 chunking strategy might be, might be more valuable to you. And that's not it. I mean, there's other pieces to think about with this. And so, you know, another was one is to think about how many results you want back from your vector database. How large is the context window of your LLM? Uh, how often is someone going to be using this? Like things like this are going to affect the way that you chunk your data, put it into the vector database and interact with it via the LLM. All right. So before we look at embeddings, I'm going to stop to answer some questions. Is it possible to do your semantic similarity query with relatively small chunks, but then include neighboring chunks into the data that's sent into the LLM to provide more context? I will answer this question later on in the presentation. Um, why is chunk size always equal? Is there a way to design a dynamic chunk size system so that each chunk part can have a unique meaning? Uh, yes, so there is ways to design, design different chunk sizes. Um, it is not something that is very easy to do but it is definitely something that you can do. And that's kind of the point of having the character splitters is you know like, hey, maybe sometimes if I see these specific characters, I need to make this chunk shorter uh, or things like that, right? So this is possible, it is just not simple. Are there any tools that help on deciding on chunk size? Um, not that I know of. So for me, that's why I showed you that example of a bunch of things is just kind of like played around with. Uh, that is just something that you have to kind of play around with. Can you talk about overlap versus sentence windows where you embed small chunks? Oh, wow. Okay, this is the same question that was asked before. So we'll talk about this later on uh, in the presentation, I think. Uh, you mentioned Q&A documents. For those documents, when each is prefixed by Q or A, is there a standard way to keep track of who is asking the question and who is answering when they are introduced at the beginning of the Q&A segments, but their names are not in every chunk? That is not actually up to you know the the way you build your application. That is much more, um, that is much more involved in the way that you create that let's say transcript. And so that is something that you know, I would consider pre-processing to the pre-processing, right? So here, what we're talking about with these advanced RAG considerations is the pre-processing to building the RAG app. What you're asking about here is maybe the pre-processing to getting your data. So the answer is, of course, there's a way to do it but it is out of the scope of this conversation. How RAG responds if database streams change? Um, I don't entirely understand this question, but let's, I'm gonna assume that you're asking if the database itself changes the data. Uh, so if you, so I will just give you the answer of how Milvis works. So Milvis does, Milvis offers this up, uh, what is it called? Uh, upsert functionality, where basically you upsert your data, same ID, different kind of text, and it just deletes your old data. Can you explain a bit more about the character overlap and why you need it? Yes. So character overlap um, maybe didn't come across very clearly in those examples, um, but character overlap is basically used to, or chunk overlapping is basically used to ensure that from chunk to chunk, not ensure, but let's say increase the chances that from chunk to chunk, you have the ability to to keep some context from the last chunk. So you know, hey, this is chunk n, this is chunk n plus one, this is chunk n minus one, so on and so on. So you have an idea of the flow of the document. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, oh, 
Uh, let's talk about embeddings. Within embeddings, I'm going to talk about three things in embeddings. So one is picking a model. One is what to embed. And this is the sentence thing that you guys are talking about in the questions. And the other is the metadata that you store with your embeddings. So metadata itself could probably be an entire uh, section, but let's just keep the embeddings into these three sections and this is how we're gonna cover it, okay? So the step, step one is that you should pick an embeddings model. Uh, so this is gonna be the interactive piece of the presentation. Um, if you know how, if, if as, so you guys can see the screen, just put into the chat, you know, how many of these logos do you recognize and which ones do you recognize? What are their names? So I'll give you, let's say to 15 seconds to kind of put this into the chat. Okay, someone says, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, someone says four, Hugging Face, OpenAI, PyTorch, Llama, Hugging Face, Llama 2, Hugging Face, I'm surprised that, oh, okay, Hugging Face, OpenAI, Llama 2, Anthropic, Hugging Face, OpenAI, Llama, Hugging Face, Claude. Okay. Ah, oh, someone's got five. Nice. Okay, someone knows all of these except for this one. Uh, well, this one's name is written right here, so, like, it's pretty simple uh, to, to guess what this one is. Um, okay, cool. This is interesting to see. A lot of people know Hugging Face. That's good because Hugging Face is really the most important uh, place to get your embeddings or at least I think it's the most important thing to know for that. Um, Hugging Face has been around for a while and it's a great model hub and you can use it for language embeddings, text embeddings, multimodal embeddings, all these sorts of things. I'm not affiliated with Hugging Face. I just really like it. Um, so, you know, Hugging Face is really important. This one is Llama 2. This is from Meta. Um, and there are a lot of rumors that Llama 3 is coming as well. Uh, this is OpenAI. I'm surprised at the amount of people who don't recognize OpenAI. Um, but, uh, hey, you know, that's that's totally cool. People probably know GPT. Um, this one is PyTorch. PyTorch is, uh, you know, one of the big hitters in ML. Pretty much everybody knows PyTorch. Everybody uses PyTorch. Um, and when I first got started in machine learning, PyTorch was like, well, I guess it was like a PyTorch TensorFlow kind of like thing. But, you know, there's still these two camps, but... Um, PyTorch offers this nice kind of flexibility that I really like and I kind of, you know, would advocate for. Uh, it also offers this thing called Torch Hub, which is really nice and that you can get, um, you know, you can get uh, uh, pre-trained models on there. And so typically if I'm going to work with images, I actually grab ResNet 50 from Torch Hub. And this is Anthropic uh, Claude, you know, you guys, you guys know this one. Um, and... They recently released Claude 3, uh, which is huge uh, and also extremely expensive. And this one is probably like super unknown. This is called AI Blocks. They are a very, very specific, um, vertical specific kind of company. And, you know, this company isn't particularly uh, huge or well known, but what they do is they particularly work with uh, legal and finance. All right. So let's think about the embedding strategies, okay? So there are some levels to these embedding strategies. Level one is you just embed your chunks directly. Just throw your chunks in to the embeddings model. Who cares what they look like? Who cares what's in them? Who cares what kind of metadata you're doing? Just throw them in and get your chunks, right? This is the basic rag. This is like when you're first starting out, you want something that works, you want to see that it works, this is what you do. And then you start refining it. And this is where these questions about uh, semantic similarity query with relatively small chunks or using overlap versus sentence windows uh, can probably be answered. So I'm going to click answer live for both these right now. And the way this in sub and super chunks kind of work is um, instead of embedding something, embedding the text and storing just the text with the embedding, what you can do is you can embed a sentence and store the sentence embedding with the whole paragraph. Or you could embed the whole paragraph and store the whole paragraph embedding with a sentence. And the reason why you would do the first one of embedding a sentence and storing the paragraph is 
perhaps you want to have a more fine grained semantic similarity search, but when you get your text back, you get your responses back, you want something that has enough contextual um, uh, cohesiveness to it. And so that is why you would do something like that. Uh, and then in the other way around, why would you embed your entire paragraph, but just return some sentences? And in that case, what you would want to do with, with the, uh, oh, sorry, and the use case for that would be that maybe you want to query against kind of a larger, um, you know, semantic similarity, but you want to be able to cherry pick which text that you actually use when you get that back. So those are the two kinds of methods that um, I would put up in like, you know, the next level up from chunking is um, from embeddings is and picking like what you embed and what you store together. And they don't have to be the same. You don't have to just store embeddings with the text that you use to embed it. And another uh, strategy that I haven't put on here um, is maybe what you do is you embed some answer to a question and you store the question with the answer embedding. Uh, in that case, or or the other way around. And in those cases, what you can do is you can find the questions or the answers that are related and, and kind of answer questions that way. And then the last part is that you're incorporating uh, different metadata, both chunking and non-chunking metadatas. So what is metadata? Let's look at what metadata is. So here are some examples of metadata. You have this chunking metadata where basically it's about how the chunk was created, right? It's related to the chunk. It's like, you know, uh, where is this paragraph? Is it the first paragraph? Um, what is the section header? You know, what is the title of the section that we uh, embed, that we chunk this paragraph from? Is it intro? Is it abstract? Is it, you know, research methods or something like that? Um, what is the larger paragraph? So perhaps you're chunking a sentence and you want to keep track of, what the larger paragraph is, right? That's that sub and super chunking kind of idea. Maybe you want to know what sentence number it is. What sentence number is this sentence in the paragraph? And then it helps you find, you know, like I was saying earlier, same thing with the uh, chunk overlap, like N minus one, N, N plus one, that kind of stuff, that kind of idea. And then there's non-chunking uh, metadata. So some metadata that you want access to is not going to be related to the chunk or the chunking strategy itself. And that kind of metadata includes things like the author, like who wrote it, uh, the publisher, like who published it, uh, the organization that published it. Maybe you want to use this for role-based access control. Maybe you want to know when it was published. Um, you know, things like that are things like that are part of the non-chunking metadata. <clears throat> okay, so the takeaway from this section is basically, you know, your embedding strategy is going to depend on the accuracy that you need. The cost, if you need, so for example, in this paragraph, in this slide here, most of the things from Hugging Face or Claude are free. Or sorry, not Claude, ah, PyTorch are free. Like you can host these on your local machine and just run them for free. Whereas OpenAI, and, and same with Meta, with uh, OpenAI or with Anthropic, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And so that's going to kind of, you know, that's something that you should consider when you're getting these embeddings as well. And the last thing, of course, is your use case. And potentially your use case is the most important piece of how you embed your data. Okay, so before we jump into vector databases, I'm gonna answer this question. How does embedding work in a video? Let's say a two hour movie when you're trying to search for a specific scene or dialogue. That's gonna depend. So for example, if you are searching for dialogue, what you would do is you would get a transcript and then you would search the transcript. And so that's the same thing as text. Now, if you have a video, that's going to be a bit more complicated. So videos, as you know, are images and uh, audio and they come combined. And there are a few ways you can do this. You can get the frames, you can get the audio, you can get the text, you can have all of these separate. You can create embeddings from all of these. And you probably won't create one embedding from each frame because if a two hour long movie, you're probably looking at, I mean, I don't know, really know how many frames, but let's say on the order of hundreds of millions, you're looking at a lot of frames. Like you could do that, but it's probably not something that you would do um, without really knowing you know, what you're doing, unless you're willing to spend a lot of money on this. 
Um, the other thing you can do is you can use a video embedding model and you can maybe do 10 seconds at a time. And that's much less expensive than embedding every frame of the movie. Uh, so it just depends on what you need to do with your movie and uh, how you want to be doing that. OK, so let's look at vector databases. So the basic idea is that vector databases provide the ability to inject your data via this thing called semantic similarity. And the considerations that you should uh, think about with this, with picking a vector database, is the scale, the performance, and the flexibility. And I'm pretty sure if you scan that QR code, that's going to take you to uh, Milvis, which is the vector database maintained by Zillis, and also what I primarily work on. And um, I would be happy if you went and scanned that and gave Milvis a start. Uh, oh, there's a thing in the chat. Uh, are there any tools for, oh, that was weird. One of my lights just went out. Um, are there any tools for role-based access control in vector databases or it has to be built in the application so that person's, ha, ah, great question. So guess what? Milvis has role-based access control. So what you can do is you can just use Milvis. Okay, so let's cover how semantic similarity works, right? What is semantic similarity? Semantic similarity is basically the idea of finding how similar the meanings behind two, two uh, you know, texts or images or videos are, or audio, whatever. And in this example, we're using words and we're using two-dimensional vector embeddings um, and we're using Manhattan distance. So words, thumbs up. This is something that people do use semantic similarity on. Uh, Two-dimensional vectors, uh, never going to be used in production. If you ever see anyone suggest they use this in production, um, you, you know, get out of there. And uh, Manhattan distance, probably also never used in production, although probably has more use cases than two-dimensional vectors. Then the idea behind this slide is basically that you can do, um, you can do, comparisons, quantitative comparisons on things that aren't originally numbers using vector embeddings, okay? So basically we're gonna do math on words with vector embeddings. And what we're gonna show here is that queen minus woman plus man is equal to king. So one thing I wanna know of importance before we get into this math here is that this slide, this, this you know, first, um, uh, this first dimension, for queen and woman are equal, and the first dimension for king and man are equal. Um, but that doesn't actually tell us what that dimension means. And in fact, no, no particular vector dimension in a vector embedding means anything. So that dimension does not mean gender or sex or whatever. It just means that these words have the same value along this particular dimension of meaning. Okay, so let me just repeat that. Um, these having the same value along a dimension is related to how the words relate to each other. It does not have anything to do with what that dimension means. So let's look at this example. Queen minus woman plus man. Okay, so queen, 0.3 comma 0.9 minus woman, 0.3 comma 0.4. Uh, we get zero comma 0.5. So this word probably means something like whatever the difference between queen and woman is. You are free to venture a guess in the chat, and I will check out what people say about this. Um, now, I want to be clear that, you know, since we don't, we haven't labeled what this means, we don't actually know exactly what this means, but I would love to know what your guesses are. And then if we add the word man, which is 0.5 comma 0.2, we're going to get 0.5 comma 0.7, which happens to be king. So the only thing you really need to understand from this slide is, Vector embeddings let you do math on things that weren't originally numbers. Vector embeddings let you do math on words. So let's see what the chat says. Uh, someone thinks the difference between queen and woman is lady. Someone thinks the difference between queen is woman is crown or royalty. I'm going to go that it's probably closer to the second one of being crown or royalty. All right. So where do these vectors come from? What are these vectors that we actually use? When so what we can do is we take any sort of data. It can be images, videos, audios, text, whatever you want. And you embed it via a deep learning model. So you run that data through a model 
And that model, typically in deep learning models, uh, will give you a prediction or a classification or something like that. But what we do to get the vector embeddings is we actually slice off that last layer and we just take the numerical outputs from the second to last layer. Why? Because as you push data through a model, as you run data through a model, every layer of your model is going to give some sort of weights and it's going to learn something new about that data. And so at the second to last layer, you have captured all of the information that that model knows about that data in numerical form without getting the prediction. And that's what we want. We want to be able to compare this information of what that model knows. And that is a vector. That is a vector embedding. And that comes out and we store that in Silis or Milvis. And so that's where vectors come from. The second to last layer of a deep learning model. Now, it's also really important that you use the right types of models for your data. For example, you don't want to use uh, you know, a sentence transformer for an image. And you don't want to use ResNet50 for text but you could use clip for either, okay? So make sure that you're using the right kind of model with the right kind of data. And this is what the basic functionality of a vector database looks like. This is what it looks like when you store data into a vector database. You have some sort of ID. Your ID can be auto-incremented or it can be something that you make up. As you can see in this example, I've made up that ID. And then you have the embedding. And the embedding is generated from that uh, is generated from the, the text. And in this case, the text here is paragraph. We define the anomaly as follows. And the rest of this is metadata. And so that is how, uh, this is how your data is stored. You need the ID. You need the embedding, because that's what you compare. And the ID is for you know uh, exact search and upsearch and things, deletes and things like that. And the rest of it is metadata, depending on how you want to use your vector database. So I'm not going to read this slide, but basically the reason why you wouldn't use a SQL or NoSQL database is because vector databases aren't real databases. Vector databases are compute engines built on top of a storage layer. And so the primary thing what you do with a vector database is you compare vectors. You compare numbers, as I was showing you earlier in that semantic similarity slide. And that is just compute. All of that is doing is comparing these different numbers and giving you some sort of math and doing some sort of math on them. And so it doesn't matter how you store your data. Sure, you can use a SQL database. Sure, you can use a NoSQL database. But why would you use something like that when you have to build a compute engine on top of it anyway, when you could just use a vector database and it comes with the compute engine as well as the storage uh, management? So vector operations are really just too computationally expensive or intensive for tra traditional database infrastructures. What about vector search libraries, right? Like face or um, scan or disk a &N or things like that. So you can use that and they're really, really useful. And in fact, they're so useful that Milvis implements face and it implements scan and it implements disk a &N, right? So it implements different ways that you can do vector search. So vector search libraries are useful, but they're not really the whole picture. They don't capture everything that you need when you are working with a vector database. And so, what you really need is the infrastructure that allows you to scale, deploy, and manage your apps in production, including things like role-based access control. Okay, so let's, oh, 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 this is not the architecture slide. Okay, so what are what is Milvis and Zillis really good for? Milvis is really, really good at handling scale. Milvis has, there are over 50, produ 50 projects in production with more than a billion vectors that use Milvis. So, you know, at let's say 100 to 1,000 vectors, it doesn't matter what you use. Use face, use whatever, like use a JSON file for all I care. It doesn't matter. It only matters when you're starting to put things into production. What you're going to need is you're going to need that scale and the ability to scale. And it's not just read scale, right? It's not just like, oh, like I can spin up a bunch of different replicas and instances and have access to, and all of them have access to the data and I can, I can spin that up. It's also things like write scale and consistency across your replicas, across your instances, right? And so that's where Milvis really comes in as, as being uh, very useful in that case. It's, it has the ability to scale reads and writes across uh, huge amounts of data. And we'll see why in a second. 
So this is the architecture slide. This is what Milvis's architecture looks like. Milvis is modeled as a pub subsystem. So here is where you kind of see this pub subsystem happening. Data comes in, it goes into the message store, and the message store publishes that data. And then the query node and the data node subscribe to the message store, and they pull in that data. And basically, when that data reaches a certain amount of size, so Milvis has this concept of segments, and segments are certain sizes that we build indexes on. And the reason why we build indexes on certain sizes is just because it's much, much more efficient to search multiple things in parallel and coalesce all the answers than it is to search an entire thing uh, in um, uh, 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 linearly. Um, and, and also, um, if you build an index, that index is static. To change that index, you would have to rebuild that index, and that's very computationally expensive. So if you want to add data, if you want to delete data, if you want to change data, like you need something that is able to build indexes in a dynamic fashion. And so that's one of the reasons why Milvis is able to so easily scale in production. Um, and on top of that, Milvis has this concept of true separation of concerns when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, uh, search. So there is the data node, which controls how the data gets ingested. There's the query node, which controls how you find your data, how you actually get your data out. And there's the index node, which covers um, how the indexes are created. And these three things almost never happen at the same rate at the same time, right? Like you're never going to be doing the same amount of queries as you're going to be doing creating indexes. Like that would be nearly impossible. And so that's why these three nodes are separate. And that's why they need to be scaled uh, separately. Um, on top of that, Milvis has this kind of like uh, stateless distributed system, right? So the coordinator service is really what, um, uh, the coordinator service is really what controls the state of the system. And it just tells the worker nodes what to do. It says, hey, I see that there's a lot of queries happening. Let's spin up some more query nodes. Hey, I see we're ingesting a lot of data. Let's spin up some more data nodes. Hey, I see the data nodes are flushing this data. These segments are getting compacted quickly or filled up quickly. We need to flush that data to permanent storage and call the index nodes to build some indexes. So that's a basic idea, a basic overview of how Milvis works. And the idea here is basically that you have a cloud native distributed system architecture with a true separation of concerns and a scalable index creation strategy. Um, 512 megabytes is just a default that we suggest. And as you scale your data up, you should have bigger and bigger segments. So the takeaway here is that vector databases are purpose-built to handle the indexing, storing, and querying of vector data, and that Milvis slash Zillis are specifically designed for high-performance billion-plus scale use cases. So give Milvis a start or chat with me on Discord. These QR codes are you know, uh, available to scan, and uh, I will answer Q&A. What does each dimension mean in a vector? Can you provide an example of a dimension? So if you remember that uh, semantic similarity slide, um, there were two dimensions. And dimension is basically just like, oh, like, you know, uh, a, a number. Um, so in, in if you have like an x, y, right, that's a two-dimensional plane. And dimensions, there is not, we don't know what the dimensions mean in a vector. The dimensions are the outputs of the different neurons in the, uh, uh, in the neural net. So um, there's almost no way to say exactly what a dimension means. What are the considerations on using asymmetric versus symmetric semantic search on your embeddings in your RAG app? Uh, I'm going to need a definition of what you mean by asymmetric or symmetric semantic search. Um, so uh, yeah, I need you to fine tune that. Uh, can there be alternate algorithms slash model uh, to embeddings to determine neighborhood of a piece of data? Um, I also don't really understand this question. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm like, I, I mean, I think the answer is like, yes, you can like determine how related pieces of data are without using vector embeddings. You can use other things. Um, but, 
if that's not what your question is about, feel free to fine tune your question and uh, uh, ask again. Can semantic similarity be determined using other models besides embeddings? Yes. Um, you can also use, well, I guess, no, te no, technically, because they're also embeddings. Okay. So embeddings, when I say embeddings, I just mean like vector embeddings are these long lists of numbers. They are the way that you quantify uh, unstructured data. They're the way that you quantify data that would otherwise not be quantified. And that's, I mean, like, that's the only way that you can quantify your semantic similarity. How does Milvis compare to the open search with KNN plugin? Well, uh, it's much more scalable. Um, so uh, that's, I mean, KNN is, is K nearest neighbors, um, which is a classification algorithm, um, which, I mean, like, I guess it's, it's, it's not, I, I, I wouldn't say that that's exactly used for semantic search, um, but, uh, you know, at scale, Milvis is a lot faster and a lot more reliable. Can you talk about pros and cons of some competing vector stores? I'm particularly interested in PG vector, Pinecone, and other commonly used products. Um, uh, sure, like PG vector is really like, it's just slow. I mean, I'm probably gonna get, this is a controversial, I guess, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but I know that Postgres has a very, very strong following with people who are very, very passionate and get very, very upset when you say Postgres is slow. But let's just be honest with ourselves. Postgres is slow and PG Vector is not any better. Um, Pinecone is closed source. I can't say anything about it. I don't know anything about what's going on underneath the hood. Um, but I will say that, you know, if you test Pinecone against Zillis, uh, Zillis is a little bit faster. And then at scale, Pinecone and Milvis are, are pretty similar. So why is Zillis faster? Because Zillis has some sort of hardware optimizations on there that are pretty cool. Um, I don't know enough about the exact hardware optimization optimizations to tell you what they are, but uh, we did do a integration with NVIDIA and GPU search and the research paper out of that at least shows that you can get 10 times the speed. Um, the other thing is like, hey, you know, uh, open source is the way to go. I'm a big proponent of open source. I think it's particularly important that uh, we have this kind of information and this kind of um, uh, uh, and have the code bases available for people so that people understand like how are these things, these things being built? Like, you know, Milvis isn't built from scratch, right? Like it's built on top of MinIO and, and at CD. Like there are other open source projects that are used and um, it's important that you can, let's say, stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Building on open source is something that is uh, very important to a lot of software engineers, um, at least, you know, with uh, the open ethos. Some people like to have everything closed because they're afraid that, oh, like someone's going to steal my software or something like that. But uh, in reality, it's really a good thing for all of humanity and the entire community for things to be open source. And this is also why I have such a strong push for open source AI models as well. For multimodal data, is it better to use an embedding which supports multimodal data, or does it make sense to have different embeddings for different data types? Does it affect query times? Um, I mean, once again, this depends on your use case, man. Uh, does it affect query times? Like, yes. So smaller embeddings probably have shorter query times, longer embeddings have longer query times, but it's not enough that it's going to matter to you unless you're doing like something that's like super, super scaled. And in which case, by that point, you probably have figured out what your use case is and you probably have a better answer to that than I can give you. Uh, okay. It seems that we're out of questions. Oh, it seems that we're... Uh, someone just asked a question that they asked already. Um, I can re-answer this question, I guess. Why is chunk size always equal? It's not. Is there a way to design a dynamic chunk size system so that each chunk part can have a unique meaning? Yes, it can. Uh, that's what the character splitters are for. Will the link to the recording be sent later? Aha, this is exactly what you guys were telling me earlier uh, at the hosts. Yes, the links are available. Uh, thank you, Data Science Dojo. Uh, 